to the Isle of Barra in the Outer Hebrides. We're about 50 miles off the west coast of Scotland. It's always a tad blowy here, but recently a particularly strong storm ripped apart this entire sand dune, revealing this. And I know it's difficult to see, but believe it or not, all this is prehistoric archaeology. But what even I can see is over here. This is a burial. Look, can you see those bones, which I suppose are ribs? All this has been exposed for the first time in thousands of years. Time Team has been called in on a three-day rescue mission to examine this extraordinary windswept site and to record the evidence before it's all blown away forever. Time Team travel all over the UK, but this trip out from Glasgow to the island of Barra in the Outer Hebrides really feels like a bit of an adventure. For a start, the only place to land a plane on this island is on the beach. Already it feels like we've come to a very different part of Britain. There are only about a thousand people living on Barra today and large areas of unspoiled landscape contain fantastically preserved prehistoric archaeology. The only threat to it is the extreme weather, which can blow away thousands of years of history in a matter of minutes. We've been called in to rescue some archaeology here at Allersdale on the western side of the island, where some burials have been exposed in the sand dunes. I have to admit, if I'd come here on my own without any archaeologists, I would have had no idea this was prehistoric. It just looks like ordinary beach scatter. Look at this. This looks like something that a couple of teenagers might have put together for a beach party last year. Yeah, I mean, I agree. It does look like somebody's had a fire for a barbecue or something. Yeah. But Victor's done a drawing look of showing what it would have looked like originally. You see, with the burial in the middle there, with all the stones around the edge. Well, yeah, that's convincing, but it's not proof, is it? Well, it is, because this actually has been excavated. There was a rescue excavation here when this, this site was revealed, and, and the radiocarbon date of 1800 to 1400 BC, Middle Bronze Age. If it's been excavated, why are we digging it? Because since that excavation, there's more erosion gone on that way and opened up a lot more structures over there, so there's lots more to do. So we know some of these burials are Middle Bronze Age, approximately 4,000 years old. But what amazes me is that they vary so much in size. Phil? Is that a burial? Yeah, that is. I mean, well, you couldn't get a body in there. Tony, you could get them in there if it was cremated. Oh. The point is that these, this is the style of, of burial that you get up here. We're calling them kiss burials. Some people like to call them a cyst burial, but to me that's more of a, a medical term, the sort of thing you lance, you know. But either way, kissed or cyst, it, it's, it's the, this style of burial where you get a little array of stones, and it's like a stone-built tomb, and you put the dead person in there. It's, it's typical. So is that one a kiss burial too? Yeah, I mean, it's a different size and shape, but it's the same basic idea. This is going to be a race against the clock. We've got three days to learn as much as we can from the wealth of prehistoric material exposed here before it's all lost for good. We've got a rare chance to build up a picture of life here thousands of years ago. And there's real excitement because we've never dug on a site like this before. Thankfully, we've got two experts with us who have, Mike Parker-Pearson and Keith Brannigan. Bit of a mess to sort out, isn't it? Yes, what we're looking at is a jumble of stones. It looks chaotic, but it's a very complicated site. The reason it's complicated is that a lot of the clutter here is relatively modern archaeology. Originally, it was in the layers above, but it's sunk down as the sand has been blown away, leaving it all mixed up with the Bronze Age burials. The first job will be to clear away the much later stuff so we can see the prehistoric remains more clearly. 
Uh, we've been looking at this. We've got a plan of this site made during the rescue dig a year ago. It shows the four kists that have already been dug and the site of a prehistoric roundhouse that's never been investigated and is now being severely eroded. So hang that's on, show me where the floor back. is. Uh, that's the floor here, this black deposit sitting above the sand yeah. is being uh, tailed off there by Kate. Yeah. The wall we think is running around there and up here we do seem to have the entrance port. So this is the wall here? We think the wall is running through yeah. here. Here's one side wall, here's the other one, so yeah. we've got a porch here. It's not easy to see, but this is the remains of a prehistoric roundhouse with the doorway still intact. Although this half of the building has been eroded away. I feel very nervous walking about on all this archaeology. Yes, you should be. It's very fragile. And to find this kind of thing, a floor that people walked about on, ate on, slept on, it's really remarkable. People have been building roundhouses on this island since at least Neolithic times. That's about 7,000 years ago. But it's more likely that our roundhouse was built in the Bronze Age, some 4,000 years ago. Or later still, in the Iron Age, making it a mere 2,500 years old. To find out just how old it is, we need to find some datable evidence like pottery. But one of the main goals of this dig will be to learn more about the many weird burial practices that went on here in the Bronze Age. And the most urgent rescue job is to investigate a kist burial here, which is being badly eroded. This kist seems to contain not only the skeleton of a small child, but also the cremated remains of another person on top of it. These bits of bone are blowing away. Look, yeah, is that I know. part of the, uh, the skeleton below? Is it, it is. The problem is that b both of these individuals actually look like juveniles. They're probably about sort of five or six year olds, so the bone right. is very, very light. And as you can see, it's almost excavating itself well, it because is. the it's sand's blowing. It's, it's blowing away. I mean, <laughs> and what's that bit there? So that's an ear bone. All right, so that's underneath here somewhere. It's right inside, that's what the, it looks like on the inside, basically. Right, yeah. right. Jackie can tell that the cremated remains were also a child burial because this tooth has survived the fire and is still intact. So that enables you to say that it's a juvenile rather than an older person. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Jackie's challenge today will be to carefully unpick the evidence in order to work out the story of this double burial. Obviously, they were done within a short, relatively short space of time yeah. of each other. They'd know that this inhumation burial was here. Now, whether they were done at the same time, yeah. and for some reason one individual was cremated and the other one wasn't, um, or whether there was several years between it yeah. and the grave was marked in some way. Is there any way we could tell whether they were related at all? No, it's, it would be conjecture, really. I mean, right. the fact that you've got two, two individuals within the same grave suggests that yeah. there's some sort of relationship. Yeah. But in a close-knit community, they could have been just good friends. Yeah. yeah. Thankfully, nowhere on the island is more than a 15-minute drive away, and we've found a bolt hole to escape the wind. The local school is going to be our incident room over the next three days. Stuart, why do you reckon our settlement's so close to the sea? I couldn't see a harbour or anything like that there. No, and it's actually quite difficult not to be near the sea here. <laughs> it's <laughs> it's not, not, yeah. On an island, which Henry's model shows really well. Yeah, the little red dots where we're digging, just in there. Look how it's dominated by these mountains and high ground. Mm. These are rocky outcrops, really difficult to, to settle on, to live on. But round the fringes here, you've got these low-lying areas. Locally, they're called maca. It's a Gallic word meaning low-lying, fertile ground. It only occurs on the Western Isles of Scotland and, and in Ireland. And it's very rich agricultural ground, so it's an ideal place to settle. One of the nice things about the maca is that because it's very soft, you can actually dig into it elsewhere. Where it's rocky, you can't dig into the ground, so it helps that concept of digging down and getting shelter there. With the Maka grassland providing the best place to live on the island, it's possible our site here could have been occupied over thousands of years. So how old is the roundhouse we're revealing in the sand? Phil reckons he's found the answer. We got this whacking great shirt of pot literally lying on the floor. A shirt from a cooking vessel, and we've actually got the top part of it, so if I very carefully pick this bit up, you see we've got bits of rock in here, so this is all going to be locally produced, this is local clay. The other side would have been out here, right. and the bottom of it down there. 
such a big old pot that is, yeah. isn't it? Yeah, and you can see the sitting on the outside, and that's from the peat fire. So it actually sat in the fire itself. And you say this is where the main central cooking hearth would have been? Yeah, right in the middle of the house. Because so just over there. You can see, as you go in, you do get more and more burning. You've got mm. masses and masses of charcoal right in the edge of the trench. That is the edge yeah. of the fire, then? Yeah, the fire would have been right down there. We're on the very side of it, and from other sites where we've excavated house floors like this, this was the cooking area. So I'm not surprised to find that there at all. This chunky bit of pottery suggests our roundhouse is Iron Age, probably built around 500 BC, a good thousand years after the kist burials were placed here in the Bronze Age. We now know we're investigating two different periods of activity on this site. But the intriguing question is, how did they manage to make pottery here in prehistoric times? Because then, as now, there were very few trees on the island and no ready source of wood to fire a kiln. Over the next three days, we're going to carry out an experiment to build a kiln based on evidence found on Barra. So is this the sort of structure they would use to fire pottery, then? Yeah, we found something like this at the Neolithic site on the other side of the island. Um, where they, they dig a, a pit, put a bonfire in, essentially put the pot in the bonfire and then they build a, a dome over it of uh, either peat slabs or slabs of turf. So it's not kiln as No, is it? no, it's what we call a clamp. Right, and they're using peat to do this? Uh, that's, yeah. That, yeah, that's one of the really interesting things about it, that by the time you get to the early Bronze Age around here, there's almost no wood left. So right. that really, in, apart from getting it going, the only thing you can use seems to be peat. So it's going to be very interesting to see whether we can get a successful yeah. firing just using peat. So it's a genuine piece of experimental archaeology then, to see how you do it, whether it works, yeah. whether the fuel works. Mm. Yeah. That'll be very exciting, wouldn't yeah. it? We've dug up some local clay to make some pots for this experiment and enlisted the help of a professional potter. Prehistoric pottery was made by hand using coils of clay. But amateur potter Mick Aston isn't happy with his materials. It's just rubbish, it's all into pieces. It's all cracking up round the edge. It's just like the generation game here, isn't it? It's terrible. <laughs> There's not enough clay in proportion to the sand. And that right. the clay is the bit that helps it to stick together and the sand is what gives it the strength. And if, if the ratio is not quite right, then you can't really make yeah. much of a pot out of it. Perhaps the answer is they didn't use this clay for potting on the island because mm -hmm. it, it doesn't seem to be suitable at all. No, it doesn't. No, but if they can't use it for pots, then if, if there's evidence of kilns, are they bringing the raw clay in from right. somewhere else? I mean, that sounds even more Or did they know a better source, a more oh, pure source? Good, good. I'm relieved to see yours is falling to bits as yes. well. <laughs> well, our potters will just have to do their best, so we at least have some pots to try out in our prehistoric clamp kiln tomorrow. Out in the sand, there's no rushing the delicate job of excavating the double burial. At the moment, Jack is busy carefully removing the cremated remains before she can start work on the burial underneath. Henry is making a 3D model of the landscape and can show the areas geophys have surveyed around the site so far. Although most of what they've detected is natural geology, their latest survey just here has revealed something they're really excited about. What we've done is work our way round from the main site, so we've come round in an arc, avoiding all the steep slopes. And look, we've got this fantastic response here. I mean, this, to me, looks like a Bronze Age roundhouse. Mm. Bronze Age or Iron Age, Yeah, it's showing up really clearly. We're standing right in the middle of it here. But you can actually see it as an earthwork as well, can't you? you see yeah. <laughs> well, let's have a look. Come on, let's have a look at it. This bank round here, look. Oh, so it's a big thing. Yeah, well, this must be the edge of it round here. Yeah. And some of those stones round that side must be the other side. Well, you could bring up a big family in that, couldn't you? Yeah, and it comes right the way round to here. I think that's the inner face of the building, so you've got a wall that's going to be really thick. Well, this is fantastic. It looks like Geophys have detected the biggest roundhouse I've ever seen. The trouble is, Mick's not sure we've got time to dig it. So what we should really do is carry on with what we're doing there, see how we get on, and then, if we've got the time, think about this and anything else John comes up with. Just now, it's our work here that gets priority. 
So that's both top and bottom jaw. Yeah. Which we've got the whole of yeah, that so mandible clear. coming round, which is nice. And that's yeah. the rest of the upper jaw that's I in see. here. Yes. Yeah. It's taken almost a full day to excavate, but we now have the story of this double burial. The original kist was built for a four-year-old child who was buried in a crouched position with a circle of stones placed around it to mark the grave and protect it from the wind. Then sometime within their living memory, another child of a similar age was cremated somewhere close by on a pyre like this. The ashes were then placed on top of the earlier burial and the stones were rearranged into a smaller circle to mark the newer grave. I couldn't make head nor tail of this this morning, but now it's really starting to make sense, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I must confess that when you said if we take the boulders off and we clear the sand off, you'll have the archaeological deposits in the side. I only half believed you this morning. Oh, thank you. It looks fantastic <laughs> it does, now, it really it? does. Yes. Well, what starting, have we got? Well, we're starting to find these uh, new kists over there and down here, as well as our early Iron Age roundhouse, there's another one and that's probably a later building. Who knows what else we've got up there? It's very, really good. What do we do tomorrow? Well, once, once we've looked at those kists, there's something earlier underneath them. Hang on, uh, hang on, hang on. If those kists are Bronze Age... Early, Middle Bronze Age, yes. And you said there's something earlier underneath them, and that's going to be Early Bronze Age or Neolithic. Yes, probably Early Bronze Age. If we're really lucky, there might even be a house under there. That'd be fantastic. <laughs> we started off this morning with a beach, and already we've got an archaeological site, thanks to some sterling work in really difficult conditions. And tomorrow, we're going to get down into the archaeology. That's if the weather holds. Beginning of day two here on Barra in the windswept outer Hebrides. And here's part of Time Team you don't see very often. The wind's so gusty that we're having to strap the portaloo down, otherwise it might end up in Glasgow. And we've got sandbags all along the bottom of the tent to stop that blowing away. The reason that we're prepared to suffer all this horrible weather is because just around the corner we're doing a rescue archaeology job. We've got some fantastic stuff around there, all prehistoric, at least two houses, possibly four burials, and we've got to work as quickly and efficiently as possible because the weather is so unpredictable that what with the wind and the rain, the whole site could be blown away at any moment. With no time to waste, Jack has started work here investigating another Bronze Age kist burial. Luckily, this one hasn't been damaged by erosion as yet, and the calcium in the sand has helped preserve these bones incredibly well. Jackie reckons we could get a really good story here. As you can see, we've got all the stones of the kists surviving here, and this has protected this grave and the full of the grave from the scouring of the, set of the wind coming up the same way as we had in the one we were looking at yesterday. And the other thing is that, as you can see from the skull here, you've got a full-size adult. So the bone is much more robust than the young individuals that we had yesterday. It's not only human bone that's preserved well, we're finding sheep, cattle and bird bones, giving us some idea of their diet. This bird bone, in fact, may also have been used to decorate this bit of Bronze Age pottery. Oh, it's almost a perfect fit. Look, one in there, one in there, one in there. We're also getting finds we've never seen before. Ah, well, this is a slightly unusual looking bone, and in fact, it's the ulna, which is part of the arm of a grey seal. So this is telling us that not only are they having sort of domestic farm animals, land animals, they're actually going out and they're hunting. If you look around the island, you can always see the grey seals popping up. The times you hunt them is in the autumn, and that's when they come onto the land to pup. And they're much slower because obviously they're protecting their pups and things, and that's when you catch them. We have evidence for them seasonally going out to the islands and actually hunting the seals. In prehistoric times, the people living here were completely self-sufficient. It's very different today when almost everything arrives by boat here at Castle Bay, which is the nearest thing to a town on the island. In the Bronze Age, one of the best places to live was here on the Macca, where it was possible to grow crops in the sandy soil. 
Amazingly, we've now found traces of prehistoric plough marks in the sand. So this was all that's left of an area of fields which probably covered most of this. And would that have been in the early Bronze Age? That's going to be early Bronze Age because it seems that the kists are cut into it. So yes, one there, one all there. Over there. Dotted all over this area, that's in it. fact, like that. Today it seems odd to find plough marks here, but in the Bronze Age, there were no big sand dunes on this site. This area of Macca was mostly flat arable fields. Macca landscapes are rare and only thrive in wet and windy conditions. In the UK, they're only found in the north and west of Scotland and in Western Ireland. Just under half of Scottish Macca occurs in the Outer Hebrides. And our dig here on Barra is a rare chance to discover all sorts of details of prehistoric life. In some cases, very weird stuff, like burying a sheep under the floor of this Iron Age roundhouse. We've actually got a sequence of features. You see this black stuff there? Mm. Now, that suddenly stops there. So our, our burial is later than that but it is very, very clearly underneath the floor. This black yeah. layer that runs right, right the way across is the floor of our Iron Age hut. So this burial must be at least Iron Age. And Mike was saying that in the northeast quadrant, which is where we are, mm -hmm. it is quite common to get animal burials buried underneath the floor. Mm, that's right. Cracking, absolutely cracking. We're uncovering a rich story of activity here over many centuries. It starts with evidence of ploughing here in the early Bronze Age, about 1700 BC. And then later on, all these Bronze Age kists are placed here around 1400 BC. We might also have some cremation pyres here, where they were burning the bones around the same time. And then at this end of the site, we've got two roundhouses that are early Iron Age, around 500 and 400 BC. Mike reckons that the roundhouses we're digging up were part of a small settlement that existed on this spot over thousands of years. Just one of the many clusters of houses dotted all along this coastline. They're not quite villages, they're hamlets, but they're yeah. separated about three quarters of a mile apart. But under this lot, there must be many, many more of them. Then. Yeah, I think this whole area that we're on at the moment, this is, will just be one small bit, five to ten percent of the total area of this yeah. uh, prehistoric settlement. Because at the moment, settlement. we haven't, for example, got the settlement where the people that were buried here lived. What we've got no, are Iron Age huts, the early Iron Age, yeah. Iron Age, whereas yeah. this is yeah. Middle Lake Bronze Age burials. Mm. And I bet it wasn't far away. I mean, no. It's quite mind-boggling how much must be buried here. Yes. Although we're uncovering the story of Bronze Age burials like this one, which Jack is now able to tell us is the grave of a woman, we haven't found any trace of where these people were living 4,000 years ago. With this in mind, Mick has decided that we should open a small trench here over the massive roundhouse Geophys detected yesterday. We want to know if this building is part of the Iron Age settlement or if it could be the remains of an earlier Bronze Age roundhouse. Just a mile or so away, we're going to attempt to get our experimental prehistoric clamp kiln going. We want to find out if it's possible to use peat as a fuel to fire pottery, because wood was in short supply here back in the Iron Age. It's thought they probably had enough driftwood to get the kiln going. In fact, we're using paper and wood as kindling, just to make sure it lights OK. The whole school that's these seven kids, are keen to see what happens because they've made their own creations to go in the kiln. And apart from the occasional use of a blowtorch, they'll be watching an authentic experiment with prehistoric technology. The plan is to let it burn for at least five hours and then we'll open it up tomorrow when it's cooled down. Here, yeah, Phil. Yo. Some cracking wall you've got, mate. Can I come in your house? By all means, Tony. Yeah, <laughs> make yourself at home. And I'll show you some of the objects that you'll find in my house. We've got these whacking great slabs of pot. I mean, I'm going to try and look enthusiastic. Look, look, that is a big piece of pot. Look yeah, at it. Yeah, it is. It's covered in sand, I know, but... Is that Iron Age? It is Iron Age. Yeah. But you see, the bit that we're really, really excited about is that 
Now, we're not sure, but we think that could be part of a mould where they're making bronze. Is that burning? Yeah, it's, it's made out of clay and it would actually have the shape of the bronze object in it. And of course you pour the bronze in and you, and you get the bronze object out. Because actually, although we call the preceding age the Bronze Age, we hardly ever find any evidence of it on our digs, do well, we? Well, that's right. But of course, you know, just because they're into the Iron Age doesn't mean to say they, they stop making bronze. Yeah. But of course, our real find is not in here at all. It's what's behind you. Yeah. You see, we've got three courses of the wall, but the thing that is really, really nice about this, we've actually got the floor that they walked and, and lived on. So we've got Phil's Iron Age roundhouse here, but the really exciting news right now is in this trench. Matt, you've got your own sand pit to play in. Yeah, it's great, isn't it? How are you getting on? Well, not bad. I mean, it was really difficult to get this turf off. It was really tough. But, I mean, as you can see underneath it, it's just this sand. We're just shoveling it out. Yeah. Matt's discovered that the building here is no ordinary roundhouse, but the remains of a massive Iron Age wheelhouse, a much more sophisticated building, so called because it was divided up like the spokes of a wheel. So what are we actually looking at here then? Well, this trench is, is just less than a quarter, just smaller than a quarter of the whole wheel. So the centre of it is just beyond the, the, the red peg there. Right. We've got the entrance to the wheelhouse here, which we've picked up on the geophysics, the, the gap in the wall. And in the corner, we've got the beginning of, of the spoke in the centre there, just where the red peg is. And then it goes obliquely out of the trench, just along that way, and then behind you there. So this is, this is actually the outer edge, probably, isn't it? So, yeah, I mean... But is it the sort of thing you'd expect to find? Well, what I didn't expect was what appears to be the great depth of stonework on a reasonably solid wall, by which I mean a wall which is two-faced. Over there, it looks like we've got an right. outer face, inner face yeah. of massive stones with some, some of the best masonry, I must say, I've ever seen on an Iron Age site in, in the Western Isles. It gets better and better. Not only have we got a well-preserved Iron Age structure here, but it looks like there are finds sitting on the floor of the building. This is just one of several pieces of whalebone. And we'll find out more about them tomorrow. So, as we approach the end of the day, we've not only got our early Iron Age roundhouses here that date to around 500 BC, but we've now got a later Iron Age building, a wheelhouse that dates to around 100 AD. And as if that wasn't enough, Jackie's also made a remarkable discovery while she's been excavating the burial of this Bronze Age woman. Jackie's detected two different layers of sand, one layer that built up around the edges, suggesting this burial had a cover on it, and a second layer that filled the kist completely. There must have been something yes. over the top yes. but that allowed material to get yeah. in from the edges. But it's obviously not going to be wood, is it? Because there isn't any wood no. really yeah. on the island. So something like, like wicker work or rush matting or something? Or it could have been a skin or, oh, yeah. or textiles mm. or something like that. I mean, skin would last quite well, sheep yes. skin or something yeah. like that. If the cover was made of animal skin, then the kist would have looked something like this when the burial took place some 4,000 years ago. Finding evidence of a cover over a burial is a unique discovery, and Jackie will continue to investigate this burial tomorrow. But already, with the three kists we're excavating and the four burials that were dug before we got here, it's clear that there were all sorts of different burial practices going on here in the Bronze Age. Some are crouched burials, one seemed to be a small mass grave containing babies and foetuses. Another had teeth from one burial thrown into the grave of another individual. One grave had cremated remains put on top of an earlier inhumation with bones pushed aside to make room into the kist. What does our burials expert make of all this? Well, this one's interesting. It's the woman in the fetal position because she's lying on her right side. And it's something we find all over Britain at this time is that women tend to be buried on their right sides and men on their left sides. Um, it does suggest that there may be a difference in lifestyle between men and women at that mm. time. But what about these other things, Mike? Some very know, strange I things know. going on, aren't there? I think when we talk about early Bronze Age burial practices, we are always thinking of either inhumation 
like that crouch That's burial. That's putting them in the grave complete, like. complete. Yeah. But of course, what they're really doing with probably the majority of people is, in a sense, rendering down the corpse, turning it into bones. So it may be that somebody's remains are basically dispersed, broken up, and put in different places. Maybe in a grave, maybe the rest in the sea, for all we know. I think we're looking at uh, a way of life in which the respect for the ancestors was far more important than in our own. And of course, keeping the actual remains of the dead mm -hmm. is in a way not just a mark of respect, but a way of, mem of memorializing them, of, of, of remembering who they were. So that they have to be treated in a way that we'd find quite odd, maybe inhabiting the same space in some cases, mm -hmm. maybe being carried around as keepsakes. I suppose you'd really have a sense of continuity. You'd know where you were in the family if you'd always got your granddad with you because yeah. he'd got his yeah. femur. Yes, and I think it's right, really interesting when those things are finally laid to rest, especially where we have these disarticulated bones, because in a sense that's saying that's enough. They now pass beyond memory into forgetting. I can't remember a time team where there are so many different things that I've wanted to see on day three. There's the Iron Age wheelhouse itself, of course. Fantastic structure, which surely can only get better. Over here, there's Phil's Iron Age roundhouse. Tomorrow, he's going to go into the floor. Are there going to be any finds there? We don't know. And then there's the pyres there where Ian's digging. What's going on there? And probably most exciting is that incredibly evocative Bronze Age woman crouched in her kist. Are there going to be any grave goods associated with her? We won't know till tomorrow. What I do know is that virtually everybody has sloped off down to the pub for a few drinks and some music. It's got to be done, I think. Beginning of day three here on Barra in the Outer Hebrides, where we're doing a rescue job on some fantastic prehistoric archaeology. The weather forecast said it was going to be better today than it was yesterday, so I don't know what's going on, but at least the rain drains straight through the sand and doesn't create muddy trenches, and it doesn't blow all over the place, so the archaeologists quite like it. Lucky them. Rain or not, we've got some amazing stuff to dig today. Phil's going to be investigating the doorway of his Iron Age roundhouse, which we think dates to around 500 BC. Outside of the main dig area, we're unearthing something even more impressive. This huge structure is what's known as a wheelhouse, a building that would have looked something like this and was built later on in the Iron Age, around 100 AD. But we're also digging some burials that were here some 2,000 years before any of the Iron Age buildings. These kist burials are Bronze Age. Although some have been damaged by erosion, this burial of a woman who lived here 4,000 years ago is perfectly preserved in the soft sand. Thanks to Jackie's expertise, it feels like we're getting to know this lady who was aged between 35 and 45, judging by the wear and tear on her knees. I'm beginning to identify a lot with this. <laughs> it's female, it's my age, and I've got rather dodgy knees too. It's beautiful the way her hands have come together in front of her face. You see, this is one of the, one of the arms coming up to the wrist here. This is the other one coming up to the wrist. And what you can see here is this knuckle bit oh, yeah. of the hand. And from there on, you can see the fingers are curling round. So really what her hands have done, they're coming together like this yes. in front of her face. Yesterday afternoon, in Phil's roundhouse trench over there, he showed me this little bit of crud and said it was evidence of bronze making. But then, when the cameras had stopped rolling, he said to me, well, I hope I haven't made a mistake, because if I have, I'll look a right wally. So, Phil, are you a wally? 
I don't think I am, Tony. I am more convinced of my statement than I was yesterday. The truth is, now that I've got into the entrance passageway to our roundhouse, you come through the entrance passageway and the doorway to the roundhouse would be here. And what they've done is they've blocked it off with these big stones. Now, the actual truth of my, of my statement yesterday lies in the material that they've used to block that doorway off because we've got here some whacking great slabs of fired clay. Those are the sorts of lumps of material that would have come out of an oven or a furnace, the sort of structure that you would associate with metalworking. So why were they blocking the door off? Well, this is something we found in quite a lot of sites from this region in this period. Um, can you see between Phil's feet, yeah. there's a thin stain coming this way. And that's where there would have been a stone slab which would have formed oh, yeah. the threshold. Yeah. So you step onto that and into the house. They've taken that out. Yeah. They've then piled up these big rocks where the house doorway used to be. So it's in abandonment. Well, maybe they've sealed it up then when it's been maybe finished. The, yeah, maybe the inhabitants died. They've closed it off. Having seen similar evidence on other sites, Mike's sure they're not working metal in the doorway but using things like moulds for swords and other industrial material to block up the entrance when they abandoned the roundhouse. It's possible metalworking was still viewed as a magical process, and these fragments may have been left as a symbol of their power. Phil's next job is to carefully unpick the stones in this doorway to see what else he can find to shed light on these weird practices. Meanwhile, over in this trench, where we're uncovering our Iron Age wheelhouse, Matt's been lifting the pieces of whalebone that were discovered yesterday. And I'm intrigued to see what our expert makes of them. Well, I can tell you that it is whalebone, and I can tell you it's a large whale. And I can also tell you it's actually it's a rib. And there has been some suggestion that people would use ribs structurally, because they've been found lying on top of houses. This one, I'm not sure it really is been used in a structural manner because it's been worked at the end. And I can tell it's rib because if you look at the ends, it's got sort of thick bone around the edge and then this sort of honeycombed bone on the inside and that's just typical of a rib. It's quite a large whale though. And also... Put it down. <laughs> I mean, if you think about a whale, all a whale is is a head and a spine, you yeah. know, and some flippers. So there's a lot of meat that you can get without needing to bring the bone back. So there is a deliberate reason why that's they brought true. it here. They bring it back. And if you think, you, we're living in an environment that's generally treeless. Yeah. There's not many trees. And if you want to make anything, you, they tend to use a lot of bone to make tools. And whalebone is fabulous because whalebone is the nearest thing to wood you've got. It's big and you can work it. Now this bit's in Pieces like this bit of vertebrae have clearly been cut and used for something, although it's hard to know exactly what. But this was the most prized bit of bone because it's the strongest. It's from the mandible, the jaw of the whale. The mandible is actually this bit here. Yeah. And it's because whales, most of their bodies supported by the water, so they have these sort of very light honeycombed bodies. But the mandible is obviously the business end of the whale. So this is where they make the densest bone, and this is where you make the finest tools. We have other ones that look like they were sort of used for weaving. This, uh, I don't really know, but you have to remember that what we see on these sites is lots of material that we don't normally find on other sites, because they're making things out of bone here that normally you'd make out of wood. And the wood would rot away. And the wood would generally rot away. So it's a bit like digging a waterlogged site. You know, you're getting preservation of things you've never seen before. In the main dig area, we've got the two Iron Age roundhouses here and a series of Bronze Age burials. But this area remains a puzzle. We thought this was where they were cremating bodies in the Bronze Age, but the latest finds here suggest they may have been making pottery. Well, you can see the, the black layer in the middle where when they fired this, yeah. the, the firing hasn't reached right through. Oh, right. It's just stopped on the edges, which is one reason why this is just crumbling. It's going back to being uh, just raw clay almost. Basically what they've done is they've just got some clay, made it into a rough old pot and thrown it into a fire somewhere. Yeah. Well, that sounds a lot like what we've been doing trying to make prehistoric pottery. Ooh, a lot of water this is the moment of truth, is it? Yeah. Our experimental clamp kiln was all about trying to use peat as a fuel instead of wood. Everyone here made something to put in the kiln. Now they get to see what happened to it. Anybody recognise that one? 
Many of the pots are broken because of the poor quality local clay. But some of the other pots were made with different kinds of clay, and these are fired well. What does that feel like if we break it in? It's oh, quite strong. It's very, yes, yeah. it is. This was actually a different clay. That's a modern clay called Kraft Crank. Um, ah, that's what we use in modern pottery classes, yeah, isn't yeah. it? So that, does that show that, that our kiln as a kiln has worked? It's not, it's not that there was something wrong with the kiln, it's that there was mm -hmm. something wrong with the clay. Yeah. Because this yeah. is really good ah, yeah. that, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting because if, if, the, if the clamp worked, mm -hmm. then all our scepticism about the um, peat as a fuel yes. was misguided. Yes. Whereas our complete cynicism <laughs> about the clay was yes. entirely justified. Yes, yes. <laughs> Halfway through day three and the sun's out again. And there's lots of work going on, particularly recording. You can see this is Phil's roundhouse and it's been gridded for various sampling. As it's turned out, there were two sheep buried under this floor and the bones will be radiocarbon dated to get a more exact date for this roundhouse. But right now, we reckon it's early Iron Age, dating to around 500 BC. But look, can you see these stones here? And you see how they go round like this. This is definitely another roundhouse. It's cut into the older one, and we think this is probably something like 400 BC. Is that right, Phil? That's about it, Tony. Having a nice time? It's cracking. I've got down onto the floor again. We're getting some lovely pottery to date it too. And it's not every day I can say this, but we're actually excavating a third prehistoric building located here. This impressive structure was built in the later Iron Age, around 100 AD. Can I get inside? A building like this is called a wheelhouse because it had a central living area and rooms radiating off it like the spokes of a wheel. So what's this thing for? Is this like a guardhouse or something? Well, this really is a reception area. Yeah. Some people would call it a guard cell, but I think it's far more likely that this is where you put your hat and coat and take your wet boots off. And then I come down here. Is this the entrance? Yeah, so you're coming into the actual building itself now. Yeah. And I think this is where the door would have been. If you look to either side, yeah. you'll see there are a couple of little holes. So you've got one there. That's right, and you see there's another one behind you there. Oh, yeah, yeah. So if you wanted to actually shut the door, you can place a wooden beam across there. And then I've got one spoke That's going along it. there. And there's another one there. Another one going along here. And it looks as though we have a third one over there. But what's really impressive about this particular wheelhouse is its size. We reckon the main room in the middle must be 25 to 35 square metres. I think one of the interesting aspects is that they probably took more people to build them than would have actually lived in them. So yeah. it suggests that some people are an ele elevated social status who can actually call on others to provide the labour. So this could be a really swanky version of the roundhouse that Phil's excavating down there. Oh, very much so. This is a, a grand design for the period. This is the biggest wheelhouse ever discovered in these islands. And it must have appeared even more impressive when it was built some 2,000 years ago. As we go in through the doorway, we can see the large living space in the centre of the building, with as many as six small rooms radiating from it. It's possible that this impressive building was the manor house of its day, and it's got to be the best prehistoric building we've ever excavated. Our rescue operation has turned up so much prehistoric archaeology and we've got our work cut out to record it all before the end of the dig. This is a rather fragile but complete prehistoric pot that'll go back to the labs for further investigation. By the way, if you check out the Time Team website, you can find out what happened to some of the finds after the dig and see a lot more of prehistoric Barra. How are you done then, Phil? We are, mate. We had a good drive right at the end, and I tell you what, we've saved the best to last. Jolly good. This is the real gem. Oh, crikey, isn't, isn't that nice? a gorgeous little bone pen? Look. Yes, they have made that out of an animal bone. You can see the surface there. That's right. It's a, it's a sheep's yeah. forearm. Yeah. Basically. And presumably, it's, a, it's for making holes in leather or something like that. That's right. They said they were bone tools, but that's the first one we've seen, isn't it? Really? That is. But it's a beauty, though. Yeah, isn't it? fantastic. Smashing.
In addition to the wealth of Iron Age archaeology, we've now excavated a total of six Bronze Age burials in this area. And the latest news here is that there's more to add to the story of this Bronze Age woman. Jackie believes that the angle of the skull suggests her head was resting on a pillow when she was laid into the grave almost 4,000 years ago. A kissed burial that we also know was covered with something like animal skin. It's a very different idea, really, from putting a body in a hole and covering it over. It's almost as if they were hoping that perhaps the dead would walk. Um, so we're getting insights into these practices, the way of life, which in some senses make you feel that you're almost sitting at the graveside itself watching this go on. And that's what is so superb. The quality of the archaeology is something we really don't find in the rest of Britain and Northern Europe. It's almost the end of the dig, and I want our experts to help me picture the landscape here in prehistoric times. When the lady in Jackie's burial was alive here mm. in the Bronze Age, what would it have looked like? The sand was already here, and it's probably got this kind of grassland over it, and behind us, the sea may have been a very long way away, maybe as much as a kilometre or even further. Sea levels were lower in prehistoric times, so there would have been even more maca grassland than there is today. But how are they using the sandy soil here? Good grazing above all, but it, it is also very easy to cultivate, of course. It's very light. Uh, they collect their rubbish, they manure it with seaweed, uh, so they can turn it into quite a good arable land as well, and very easy to turn without, of course, the, the benefit of a, a proper plough. These high sand dunes weren't here back in prehistoric times. Around 1700 BC, this area would have looked more like this. And amazingly, what we found in the sand were the traces left by an ard, a prehistoric plough a telltale sign that they were farming the sandy fields here in the early Bronze Age. But the picture changes in the Middle Bronze Age when we know these fields were used as a burial area, with kists dug into the sandy soil. We didn't find any trace of Bronze Age roundhouses, although there must have been some close by. But by the early Iron Age, around 500 BC, we know there was a cluster of roundhouses here, a small settlement with people farming and hunting. A settlement that in the later Iron Age, around 100 AD, we know included my favourite building from this dig, the huge wheelhouse. When I first came here, my idea of what the Hebrides was going to be like in prehistory was a few people clinging to a rock, trying yeah. not to be swept into the sea. And uh, over the years, I think I've just my whole perception has changed when I realised that they led a very comfortable life, that they were doing nicely, thank you. 